Hi everyone, this is Rajivan Jung from PhD Expertise and today we have a uh, special guest with us and that is uh, Dr. Namrata Sangupta and she is a trained scientist, science communicator, career coach, advocate for uh, equity in health and STEM and uh, she has a really interesting story to be able to share with us today. She did her undergrad and master's degrees from India Xavier's College and Bangalore University. And then she did her PhD in environmental toxicology at Clemson University. And now she's a program manager at the Broad Institute of MIT and Harvard. So thank you, Dr. Sengupta, for being with us today. How are you? I'm good. Thank you so much for having me on this uh, PhD expertise uh, showcase. Uh, so nice to meet the two of you. Awesome. Great, great. We, <clears throat> we have a uh, full slate of questions for you, but we want to start off a little bit about your undergraduate time, your master's time, and then your decision to come to the United States. What was the process that you used post master's degree to say, okay, I want to come here to the US and I want to you know, do a PhD? Thank you. Great question. I did my undergrad in chemistry from Kolkata, like I was in St. Xavier's College, and then for my master's, I knew I wanted to shift more towards like applied biosciences because that's kind of like how I thought I would shape my career towards if I go for a PhD. And uh, I landed up doing my master's in biotech. And during my master's, this is a really interesting story. I think like my PhD framing kind of starts from here. We had a speaker, a scientist at uh, our university who came to talk about lead toxicity and how it impacts you know, public health in India. And his name was Dr. Thupil Venkatesh. He was from the National Referral Center for uh, Lead Toxicity in India. And Dr. Venkatesh's talk kind of, you know like how in your career or sometimes as a student, you have this one moment where you like meet somebody or hear somebody talk and it like sparks this interest. And that was that moment where I got interested both in toxicology and in science communication. I remember like telling people, I came out of the talk and telling everyone, I want to be like Dr. Venkatesh. Like he was speaking to an auditorium of 500 students and he, like everybody was just like thrilled by the science he was sharing, the way he was sharing it. And I was like, I want to be like him. Like this is so impactful. So it was, I think first year in my masters, I immediately like started looking up public health projects which were available on campus. I started going to professors in the medical school on our campus and asking, do you have a project? Do you have some pilot I could work on? And I eventually got a funding from, the Intel, from Intel India on an environment research project I ran on campus where I did a lot of like public health communication on campus. I took a decision at that time that I am not going to immediately apply for a PhD. I just got so interested in the field of environmental health and public health that I took a break for two years and I worked for a grassroots level nonprofit organization in Bangalore, India for two years. And during those two years, I was preparing for my GRE, taking my GRE and also looking up, being very thoughtful and being very like systematic in the way I was looking up PhD programs. Given the motivation I got from Dr. Venkatesh's work and doing all the work I was uh, associated with through my through the nonprofit work experience, I knew that I was gravitating towards environmental toxicology, but more in like aquatic toxicology. So I did like, hello, thank you, Google, <laughs> because sitting in India and Bangalore and not really knowing anybody personally who is in the US doing toxicology, I basically depended on like going through university websites, finding out where there is a, which universities in the US had really good environmental toxicology programs and which labs within those programs were focused on aquatic toxicology. So that was my first approach. And that's how like Clemson came in my radar. Like people often ask me, how did you land up from Calcutta or Bangalore in India to Clemson, South Carolina, which is like it's popular in the US as a huge football school or popular for engineering programs, but not a lot of people in my network knew about toxicology. And I said like, Clemson has a really good environmental toxicology program. And I got through the lab of Dr. William Baldwin in uh, toxicology and uh, I focused, my research was then, I went on to study uh, aquatic toxicology. Okay, so that's no, been my approach, yes. And they well, offered me, Clemson offered me a five years contract for teaching assistantship. So I knew my stipend and my funding was confirmed for five years. And that's that plays a huge role when you're coming from like somewhere like India as an international student to choose 
a lab and choose a university which has secured funding for you. Yeah, no, and that totally makes sense. And we hear that story um, quite often is that it's it's important, especially if you're coming somewhere else to to have security, that way you can focus and do the right things, right? Do focus on on the work that you, you want to focus on. But you also, you know, during your time at Clemson, you also had just a really interesting broader experience. You were a part of a lot of different organizations. Can you just talk a little bit about what that experience was like and, and what you focused on and how that sort of led you to where you where you are now? Yeah, thanks. Uh, that's a nice question to reflect on. Like it's been almost four and a half or five years. Uh, when I came to Clemson, like early on, honestly, like right before even I got through Clemson, right in my statement of purpose for university application, or when I first interviewed with my PI, and then I came here, from very early on, I did explain to my professors that, look, I'm not, I'm not doing this PhD to like get into postdoc or academia, like professor career path. Like I have grassroots level nonprofit experience working before this. I want to make sure that my PhD and the work I do beyond this kind of uh, relates to more something which is in the public health sphere. That's something hard to do because you, everybody around me was like doing their PhD with like a lot of mindset of going into postdoc, getting a postdoc or going into like, you know, the tenure track. And then me out there being very honest with my PI and other professors that I'm not going to apply for a single postdoc. That's the reality. Like, and I was confident about that right from my first year and first day in grad school. My PhD, I, I loved my project. I, uh, it's, and being an environmental toxicologist, I think like you kind of feel like your work and the research you're doing actually has like environmental health impact because all the data you're generating and all the papers you're publishing is going to be read by environmental regulators. It will be used in some capacity in decision making. So you always feel that your research has some like broader impact. During my PhD, I looked into the effects of environmental contaminants like atrazine, which is a popular pesticide. It's already banned in the EU, but US still has use of atrazine. And uh, triclosan, which is another uh, chemical, which is uh, pharmaceutical, it's popularly used in toothpaste you know, it's an antimicrobial compound. And I looked at how these kind of chemicals uh, impact environmental health. I was basically focusing on freshwater, like freshwater ecosystems. So as a lot of scientists use like a model organism, the model organism I used in the lab was a freshwater flea, which is called Daphnia magna. And, you know, in environmental toxicology, it's like, EPA has certain sets of tests that you run for chemicals. And the first set of tests and the first set of experiments you always do on Daphnia. And then the results you find from that, then you do it in higher organisms. And then ultimately it gets into human health. So I studied for five years. Uh, I worked in the lab with Daphnia and I did a lot of experiments. And the questions I asked were kind of like, how do any of these chemicals impact the health of freshwater organisms like Daphnia? But and how do they affect at a population level of the species, but also at like uh, at a species like individual level? Like, for example, are they actually if affecting some genes in the organism? So I did a lot of gene expression studies or are they affecting some lipid pathways? So I looked at the biochemistry and the molecular biology uh, type of experiments in my research. So it was like a nice way of seeing like organism to like a species level effect. One other thing that happened was during my PhD, by the time I was in second year, I was speaking to some of my colleagues and said, look, all of us are doing projects which have a lot of like environmental and public health impacts. And I think it's really important for us to go out and speak to the communities. And why don't we start with our local high schools where there are students who, are, who could be interested in environmental health research careers or like uh, interested in being a scientist. And we co-founded, along with four of my colleagues, we co-founded this water quality environmental research outreach program called WOW, What's in Our Waters. Mm -hmm. And it was run fully by grad students. Uh, we were all like PhD or master students in biology or toxicology. And we ran this program with a local high school. And we would go into the classroom. We would teach students about what environmental health research is. And then we would give them a background of like how they could do it also. In the next part, we would take them into the field and we would do water quality testing with them. In the third part, we would bring them into the classroom and then 
look at the data they've collected and teach them how to like collect the data and then like make like a scientific poster and present their findings. And in the fourth part, we would invite them to the university to present their work, university like uh, grad students and PIs and postdocs. We would give them the experience over one whole semester of what it's like to have this entire experience as scientists. And as like young scientists interacting with students, we would also try to address the thing like, which a lot of students often have the perception of how they think scientists are. And when they would meet scientists from a diverse background and people who they did not essentially think are scientists and interacting with them, they would also find mentors and role models in science. Yeah. So that was like a really cool program. And I often tell people, you know, I had like my PhD where I was publishing papers, doing working in the labs 10 to 12 hours a day. And then I had this, the wow, which was like almost like a side project. It was a side project. And I wish that I almost wrote like a thesis chapter on WOW <laughs> along with my main. So that really defined uh, a lot of my uh, foundation for continuing like community outreach work. I loved the part that I could go to conferences and talk to like people from government, people from industry, people from academia. But at the same time, I loved the fact that as environmental toxicologists, we were going into the community and talking to high schoolers and their teachers and like telling them about what environmental health research is, you know? So you, you get that whole suite of exposure. So Namrata, I guess you kind of touched on the next question I was about to ask you. So yeah, instead of going to a traditional professorship or an industry job, I think that's the majority of us go to. And you decided to work in the science communication field. Can you just talk about how did you make that decision and how did working at the Journal of Visualized Experiments uh, help continue to develop your skills? I think it wasn't like a one moment, like, you know, sudden realization overnight. Uh, I guess a lot of pieces, you know, like fitting together many pieces from different experiences and different conversations I had with people. I definitely gravitated towards science communication uh, because I really cared about it. I just made sure that anytime I was talking about my research to anybody, I made it relatable. So it was like almost like a personal passion project it started with. I started writing like blogs, explaining research about just generally toxicology topics to broader audience. Then I was like very active with the scientific society. Like, you know, as PhDs, you're pretty active in like one, at least one science society. And I founded like-minded individuals, other postdocs and uh, under, sorry, grad students there. And we like started this outreach club there. And I was having wow, like which was like a pretty uh, integral experience of grad school. I started meeting more and more people like who were doing this full time. And I did a lot of information interviews, talking to people about what they thought their career was like. And they also asked me very important questions which framed my thinking. That is, what do I want to do with my career? And when I slowly started seeing that, oh, wow, I could actually do a full-time job in something that I'm really good at, and it would make a complete sense because a lot of these organizations in this particular sector were hiring people with PhDs in this, in this field, I thought, like, I can actually think about it is in my career search or job search process. In my final year of PhD, I was job searching for both, like, consulting jobs. I was applying for environmental consulting jobs because those are very applied. Like, you know, you actually are involved in decision making with like regulations. And at the same time, I was also applying for science communication jobs. And that's when like happened to come across this job at Journal of Visualized Experiments, Job. They, I clearly remember when I applied for it on LinkedIn, the job title was science evangelist. And when I read the description, I was like, wow, that science sounds like me. Like they said, we're looking for somebody with a PhD in a life science field who is an excellent communicator, who has run very successful social media and blog campaigns and is ready to learn the business side of things and contribute to a journal that helps PhD students and postdocs and PIs every day in their research. You know, I know about this product. I know why PhDs use this. And I know I can communicate. So I applied for the job. I got the interview and uh, took that up as my first job out of grad school. I moved to Boston from South Carolina. Uh, and uh, I think like, Jung, you asked, what was that like, you know, working at Jove uh, and uh, what kind of skills I continue, I grew from there. I think like your first job out of grad school, 
is not necessarily always like the picture perfect dream job you think of. But if you're somebody who's looking to grow new skills or you are somebody who knows for sure that you don't have a lot of experience in that area of work, choose a job which will really let you grow in that. And I think Job was such a great fit for me. I kind of found my space there because like I was surrounded by so many others who were PhDs. They were in roles where each of us had this passion to make science and complex research accessible and break it down and help other PhDs and postdocs and scientists. So somebody was like helping with video production, somebody was helping with script writing. My role was like science communication specialist at Job. So I essentially was like interviewing scientists talking about like, why did they do like a Job video? Like how can their video of their experiment be helpful for other scientists? What can other scientists run from their work? So I developed a lot of skills in writing, social media. I developed a lot of skills, which honestly you'll only learn in like a for-profit work space, like business skills. Like what is the, if I go and pitch an idea, never, in my grad school would my PI have asked me, what is your return on investment on this idea? But <laughs> just understanding that you have to explain the impact to convince somebody about your project, that was just a great experience. And uh, the audience I was communicating to were mostly other scientists, like those who use the product. It's a journal which is essentially a video journal that shows your experiments, the methods of your experiments in a video format so that other scientists can watch it and repeat the experiment or learn how to do the experiment and uh, trying to address the reproducibility crisis which many scientific groups uh, face. I don't know if I answered your question or like, it went kind of tangential in many yeah, ways. Absolutely. So now you work as the program manager for the scientific public engagement at the Broad Institute of MIT and Harvard, you probably reach an even broader audience now. Uh, yes. And what does that your role entail? And, and how, how is this Broad Institute different from a typical research center or research lab at, at university? Yeah, I'll start with a little backstory and then I kind of, you know, why from Jove I went to Broad and then kind of uh, respond to your two questions. In I was working at Jove when around in 2017, my mom passed away from chronic kidney disease. Came, I went to India for her funeral. I came back and then I kind of had this moment like, you know, where I just sat down and thought that how does my everyday work really make an impact on health? And uh, up until like grad school, I was just very focused on environmental health. And then I made this shift in science communication and I had my job at Joe, which I was thoroughly enjoying. And then at that moment, I thought that how can I use my skills and use my work to actually impact human health and disease? I made a short list of organizations that are in Boston area and who are doing incredible work in human health disease research and how I could position myself, like apply for a job in one of these places where I was coming from a science communication background. I had a PhD in life sciences and I wanted to find an organization that is mission driven and a nonprofit. And I wanted to get back to like closer to academic research where the science is happening and like be mission aligned with a place like that. So it's around that time that I came across, I already knew about the Broad Institute of MIT and Harvard. I live in Cambridge. I, I was already working in Cambridge and it was already here. And I applied for a job and I interviewed and I got through Broad. Broad is this interesting place. And I want to take the moment before I talk about my job to explain what the organization is. It's about a 16 year old organization. The motivation for the organizations kind of started a little after the Human Genome Project, which really changed the face of genetics and biomedicine in the world. And uh, the founders of Broad Institute at that time, 16, 17 years ago, came together, said that they wanted to find a way that researchers from Harvard, MIT, and the Harvard-affiliated hospitals could come together and start a research institution where the sole mission accelerate the pace of human health research by leveraging like genomics and the power of genomics at that time. And uh, that's how Broad Institute was founded. And it is like independent research nonprofit. But it's an interesting model because a lot of scientists at the Broad are PIs. 
And Broad is not an academic, like it's, it's not a university. So the PIs either have a Harvard or a MIT affiliation. So they could be an associate professor at MIT and they have a lab at Broad. Or somebody could be a physician and a scientist at Harvard Medical School. And they have a collaborator and a partner project at Broad Institute. And I think like what really helped is the ecosystem that is Boston and Cambridge ecosystem. Every, all these institutions are only one train stops away from each other. So I think like this model thrives here is because you could have had like, maybe you're a doctor at Mass General Hospital and you were there in the morning and then in the afternoon you take a train and you come to Broad Institute and you're meeting with your lab, having a lab meeting or a seminar there. So there's this like this cross disciplinary collaborations only with the common mission of doing cutting edge research. If anyone listening to this interview, if you're from like a life science field, like check out careers at Broad Institute. If you are looking for postdocs, if you're somebody who's from bioinformatics, software engineering, math, like all of these fields, uh, people are coming together from these diverse backgrounds to come and work at a place which wants to impact human health and disease. So that's kind of the broad. And I sit in a really great team at the Institute. I'm a part of the Office of Communications. I often explain my job is like, I'm a scientist who helps other scientists talk to non-scientists. And that kind of like uh, has been a big motivation for me. And Zhang, as you said, like my audience has become broader. It is true. Like that's what I love about my job is because my role here is to make sure all the science and the research that is coming out of the broad and our team does a lot of communication through like writing videos infographics uh public talks my role in public engagement is to make sure that i make meaningful partnerships in the community by that i mean not scientific community i mean like the general public to make sure that every all the research that is happening here gets communicated in an accessible way and people are getting that information wherever they are. So, you know, like uh, I partner with different people d on different projects. Uh, I'm also a part of like a science museum project at our institute. We want to build a science museum in the lobby of our building uh, sometime soon. And uh, my entire mission in my role is to make sure that I am helping communicate about the complex scientific research happening at our institute that is trying to address a lot of big questions in biomedicine and how can i help our scientists to make that information accessible to the broader community i see so namrana we're very honored to have you as our very first female guest speaker to our, mm -hmm. our program so we would like to talk some uh, diversity and inclusion according to the american association of university women women only make up less than 30 percent of the workforce in the stem fields what has been your experience studying and working in the uh, STEM fields? Yeah, uh, it's a great question. And it is something that I have frequent conversations with people. It's interesting. I'll give a little bit of context, you know, my experience of growing up in India and then coming to the US and how I have perceived women in science and the role of women in science. If I start about my experience in college, my undergrad was in chemistry, where 50% of my class was uh, men and 50% were women. And then so did, so were my professors, 50% of them were women and 50% were men. Then I went into an, my master's in biotech where 70 to 80% of my classmates and my professors were women. So I was constantly like in India experiencing in the field I had chosen that there was representation of women in those fields. Then I came into toxicology and uh, there also I saw a very equal balance of like men and women in the field. So when I started talking to my friends in engineering and I noticed that, oh, that's not the same in some of like their experience of sitting in an engineering classroom or their experience being a female computer coder. And we, it's, it's interesting to observe like because it impacts like what you studied and where which topics you are there and what is the representation. And uh, I'm in a career in science communication, once again, where there is a pretty uh, good representation of women in science communication. So often I try to broaden the lens and think about more intersectionality when I think about equity and uh, inclusion in uh, science. And yes, there's one thing about women in science, but like in the particular space you're looking at, what kind of women, right? Like are the women with similar kind of educational backgrounds are 
all the women in that field from the similar like racial and ethnic background. So I think it's a very complex and nuanced question. And I think it kind of matters where you are, in what context you are, and in which spaces you are within STEM. And the other interesting thing I wanted to share was, and I like that question, like one, I think one of you earlier said there's a lack of, it could be a lack of role models in STEM, and I'm always very mindful of that. And I always make sure that if somebody is asking me to like speak somewhere or be a mentor, I raise my hand for that because I know like role models make a lot of difference. As a woman in science, like I have always felt very celebrated and valued all through growing up years. I always got the impression and thankfully, like, you know, my parents and my family have been so supportive that I always got the impression that everything is possible, but I am aware not everybody has the same experiences. So I definitely want to acknowledge that I've been really lucky that I was never discouraged by my immediate network to like pursue something or follow something. But I'm mindful that this will not be the same set of experiences for other women in the space. So if I'm asked somewhere to be a mentor or a role model or speak to somebody, I try to listen as much as I can and then try to offer advice being mindful of like what their own set of experiences would could be and how they are different, acknowledging that they are different from me. So I think that that's a really great set of points you made. I think the, the last question that uh, Jung and I had for you, at least, was that um, you've had all these experiences. Is there any one piece of advice you'd be you'd like to give the audience to let you know a lot of the audience are PhD students, but they're also people who are looking to make transitions in their career, right? And looking to find the thing that makes them excited and uh, makes them happy about what they're doing. So could you share anything? Uh, that you've learned along the way would be helpful to them? I think like one suggestion and which is like a very common thing you'll hear a lot of people giving this advice and only because it really works is because talking to people outside your department and outside your area of work is very helpful. Uh, in I can talk about life sciences, you know, and there was recent NSF data around that. Around 70 to 80 percent of people with a life science PhD degree or a master's degree go on to pursue careers which are not in academia and yet if you think about your experience in grad school like as a phd student for five years the people you're surrounded by at all times are pis and postdocs and people in academia so if your department or your graduate school experience or the science societies you're associated with are not intentionally trying to create some experiences for you about or the opportunities for you where you get to meet people from other sectors, you are essentially then locked out or like you're not opening up to speaking to conversations with people in these other careers. And so you're not finding out. So for example, what you both are doing is something great. Like you're getting these PhD students to access in a way to opportunities or uh, information about opportunities in other sectors. I think that is very important, like just doing Professional development is something which I know we are all dependent a little bit in some way in what our institutions provide, but in some way, I think it's important for you to like guide that for yourself. I think all PhD students are pretty great at doing their research, like reading complex science and like finding out how that relates to their questions and analyzing complex data. So everybody kind of has a core set of skills to unpack very complex sets of information. If you're really invested in like thinking about your careers, I would suggest start early. Don't wait until like the final semester of your PhD or don't wait until you're three years into a postdoc to start thinking that, oh, you know what? I think I find, let's say science communication interesting. Can you tell me what to do? Why I'm saying this is because during the term of your graduate school, you have access to a lot of things which could help you advance or collect these uh, credentials that are essential in a job interview process. Like I could relate to some of my examples is because the five years I spent in grad school, I could start an outreach program from scratch. And, you know, I could show skills that, oh, I was able to, I was a co-founder, I managed it, I mentored people, I ran it successfully, and I communicated science successfully. Five sets of skills but I had enough time for four to five years of my PhD to build those. 
But when I realized that I'm interested in science outreach or science communication in the final semester of my PhD, I have missed out on the five years already. It's kind of being intuitive about exploring some other opportunities, learning, like taking some courses, which are not necessarily in your immediate department. Like I requested my PI to allow me to take courses such as environmental law and policies, uh, the politics of science, then science communication or using improv in science communication. And these were not offered by my department, but they are being offered by other immediate like programs or departments. So I think like taking courses like that, if you're, if you think that you're interested in a career in business or industry, see if you can take courses from the business school during your, alongside your PhD. If you are interested, you think you're a great writer and you want to write for a broader audience after your PhD, whether it's a grant writer, whether it's a science communicator, whether it's like working as an editor in a, in a scientific journal, take some writing classes during your PhD. These are being offered on your campus and you can take it alongside like being a full-time PhD researcher. So these are certain things like start thinking early, talk to many people, start doing information interviews, read about different careers, be active and network on LinkedIn and some of these professional networks. Take advantage of the time you have on a campus. I think that's that's huge. And I can't like say how beneficial that is, the opportunities you can get. It's easier to ask, like, let's say you can, it's easier to ask your department, hey, like, I want to like grow my skills on social media. Like, can I do like a volunteer internship with you to run the department's social media? It's easier to ask. The worst thing can happen is somebody will say no, but if you don't ask, you will not know if that's even a possibility. So that's kind of my broader advice. I know it, it was a bit science communication example centric because mm -hmm. I could use examples from my own PhD career life, but I hope that was helpful yeah, in some capacity. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah, those are great advice. And Namrana, uh, we really appreciate you being with us today. And uh, thanks to everyone for watching this. If you have any comments or questions for Namrata, please email them to phdexpertiseteam at gmail.com and stay tuned for our next episode. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.